Well, praise the Lord. We are going to begin a new series of studies tonight to help us to examine our lives to see where we are with respect to overcoming and being prepared for the end time. The Lord has given some messages concerning alternatives. Tonight, alternatives to crucifixion. And then the other side of the coin, next time, Lord willing, alternatives to victorious living. So tonight it's Galatians 2.20, God expects us to be crucified with Christ, but there are many ways in which people seek to avoid crucifixion, the death of self, and that's what we want to be looking at tonight, some of those ways. Some of the alternatives to crucifixion, for example, and these are just some, are things like blaming others for your own faults and mistakes and problems, or attempting to live the self-life and substitute that for the crucified life, self-survival, or substituting self-denial for the denial of self, and they're not the same things. Self-denial is not denial of self. Or running from responsibilities. Or, as it is so popular today, building self-esteem instead of crucifixion of self. The self-image. Well, these are some of the ways in which people seek to avoid the death of self, alternatives to the crucifixion of self. And let's look at some of those tonight. First of all, the alternative of the practice of self-survival. The practice of self-survival. Now, why is this practiced? It's because self-survival is the basic instinct of all created things. Self-survival is the basic instinct of all created things. Whether it's a tree that gets injured, it will try to heal itself to survive, or an animal or person. Self-survival. Even the smallest creature, like a mouse, if it's cornered, will, well, often fight like a tiger. I remember one time going out in the yard, and there fluttered out of the tree a dove that I thought the thing had been poisoned or something had happened to it because when the dove jumped out of the tree, it began to flutter and fall to the ground and act like it was wounded and injured. And as you try to walk toward it, it would just move ahead of you a few feet. And then I looked back at the tree and there was a dove's nest in there with the young. And of course, what the mother was trying to do was to get me to think that she was wounded and draw my attention away from the tree. Survival. And of course, there wasn't anything wrong with her because she headed back for the tree after I left. But self-survival is the basic instinct of all created things, whether it's a leaf on a tree or an animal or whatever. I've read like survivors back in World War II when they would try to escape the Nazi concentration camps or maybe a plane down at sea or a ship would sink. And by sheer willpower alone, because of this instinct for survival, men would survive under conditions that, well, if you'd read the story, it would be impossible, and yet they survived anyway. And so self-survival is the basic instinct of all creation, and so that's a substitute for the crucifixion of self because that's so basic in your nature. That's what caused the twelve disciples to forsake Jesus at the time of his arrest when just a few hours earlier they said they would die before they would do that. But it's that instinct of survival of self. That's why they fled. That's why some have fled faith assembly, by the way, is because they began to see the handwriting on the wall, not this handwriting up here with the quotation of the Word of God, but they began to see the handwriting on the wall. You know what it was going to cost them if they stayed with the message, the persecution, and when they passed a law against faith assembly, well, let's just say concerning childbirth at home, 
when the state passed a law, they began to see the handwriting on the wall. And so self-survival was uppermost in their mind. And because they were not sure they could survive the persecution and trials, or let's say they were thinking if they had a baby that died or whatever, then, of course, they fled just like the other disciples did with the instance of Jesus and his arrest. So the question I suppose we're asking first of all is what is your first priority? Is it Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, or is it self-survival at all costs in time of trial and persecution? You know, I found over the years that there are some people, the first thing they will forsake in order for self to survive is the Word of God, the Bible. Well, of course, that's not surprising in view of the parable in Matthew 13, where Jesus said they would. Over trials or persecution because of the word, they'll forsake the word. Now, they won't always admit they're forsaking the word. They'll rationalize it some way. They often stay religious and that sort of thing. They just find a wider path to walk in, an easier way. But it's interesting how because of the fear that self cannot survive persecution or trial or whatever, in time of trial or adversity, the first thing people forsake is the Word of God, whether they're talking about the pure Word or the whole Word or whatever. I remember reading about some explorers, this is a long time ago, when it happened, we'll say it's in the Arctic, and they got iced in during the winter. The ship was crushed to smithereens by the ice closing in. It was a wooden ship. And before it was totally destroyed, they took supplies off and took one of the big lifeboats off. And they stayed there for several days and saw they couldn't survive there just in the ice. And so they put the supplies in that boat and they pulled it across well, miles and miles of ice trying to find some open water so they could launch out and maybe find a passing ship or whatever. And just before they did that, the leader of the expedition said that anything that was not absolutely essential to survival, you had to discard. And he set the example and threw his Bible away. That's literally true, but took his banjo. So the first thing that people think about many times because of the fear they can't survive is to turn away from the Word of God is what we're saying. I thought, what a perfect example. If you need one thing to survive out of all you've got, it ought to be obvious it would be the Word of God. That'd be the thing you'd want to take. And so because of fear of survival, this is what causes people to be deprogrammed from the Word of God. There's a lot of that going on now. We've had at least three experiences and maybe more that I haven't heard of in this church. Fear of survival causes people to allow themselves to be deprogrammed from the Word of God, from truth, from the faith message, the divine healing message. You see, instead of confessing the Word of God in time of such a trial, and I mean that is small potatoes to what the Russians, for example, and Chinese have done to deprogram people. All they do is yell a little bit at you. You ought to read some of the stories what some of the atheistic countries do to deprogram people from Christianity or whatever, political views. But anyway, instead of praying in the Spirit, and that will give you the victory, confessing the Word of God, making a positive confession. They allowed themselves to be deprogrammed. And I'll tell you why, because they had the Word in the head, not the heart. You can't deprogram the heart. There's nothing can deprogram the heart, but they can deprogram your head. They can brainwash the head. And so, if a person is being crucified with Christ, he couldn't care less about self-survival because self's on the cross, being crucified anyway. Hello. Amen. How can you be deprogrammed from survival of self when self isn't supposed to survive? Self is supposed to be on the cross. You see, if you really had the word in your heart, and some of you don't know yet whether you have it in your heart yet, because as I say, people who sat here allowed themselves to be deprogrammed, not all. 
One brother told me that they tried it. It didn't work on him. Well, I don't know why it should work if it's in your heart. But you see, an overcomer, when they're trying to deprogram him, will say, at least inwardly, do or say whatever you want. You can't touch the inner man, and the old man's dead. So what can they deprogram if it's in your heart? And what's so new about deprogramming anyway? It's been happening for years from the pulpits. And still is happening where they're trying to deprogram their followers from the present day charismatic outpouring, the truth of divine healing, the faith message, faith in the promises of God. So what's new? Deprogrammers in the pulpit are no different from those who kidnap people, except those who kidnap you maybe shout a little louder, that's about all. But all you have to do is listen, read, Turn the radio on, and I don't recommend radios. I'm just using it as a figure of speech, and you'll find that they're deprogramming their listeners day after day. So if it's in your heart, friends, they can't take it out. If they can ever take it out, it wasn't in your heart. It was in your head. It was in your intellect. I mean, if you're afraid to face the music, as we used to say, then don't join the band. So another method of self-survival, besides this one we're dealing with, the deprogramming aspect where people give up, compromise the Word of God, another method of self-survival is blaming others or other things for your problems, your mistakes. I'm talking about people who say they're being crucified with Christ or want to be crucified with Christ. Dear friend, if you really wanted old self to die, you wouldn't attempt to defend old self. You just let it die. And one of the best ways to die is when you're wrong and someone points out you're wrong, or even if you aren't wrong, is to let self die. Not justify self, not blame self. That goes on all the time. It goes on in this church. Instead of facing the fact that you're wrong, and I'm not talking to anyone except to whom it applies, of course. If it applies to you, then die to it. But the point is, Instead of facing reality and saying, that's right, I lack faith at that point, I missed God, or I'm weak in this area, and it was pointed out from the pulpit or by a brother or sister, instead of admitting that, you try to justify or to blame the person who is pointing out to you that you've got a problem. You know, there are only 5% of the people who will admit the wrong when they see the wrong. Only 5%. And 10% will admit they're wrong if you point it out to them. The 5% see it themselves and shape up. Only 10% will admit they're wrong if it's pointed out to them. That leaves 85% who would rather die than change or admit they're wrong. That's where most of the world's at in that 85% category, religious or non-religious world. I've seen people lie and argue and change their position, change their previous statements, anything in the world to keep from admitting they're wrong. They say, oh no, oh no, you're wrong. You misunderstood something I said or whatever. As someone pointed out, they weren't talking about this, but they said, you know, that some get their exercise this way. To keep old self alive, they get their exercise this way said they jump to wrong conclusions, you know, if you are dealing with them. They stretch the truth. They run from any exposure of their error. They bend over backwards to avoid the obvious. They lie to keep from admitting the wrong. And they sidestep every question that would reveal that they are at fault. Well, that's an exercise, I guess. Jump, stretch, run, bend, lie. Sidestep. You could probably add some more. See, self-survival is what causes you to criticize others when you think you see a fault in them. But if you analyze the situation, if the faults that you think you see in others were not in you also, you wouldn't be able to recognize them so easily and so quickly. That's Romans 2. Why do you judge your brother or another because he said the same things that you judge in others? 
you do yourself. Well, I've got a suggestion when you find a fault in someone and they're finding a fault in you, why don't you just exchange faults because both of you believe that you know what the other needs to get straightened out. In fact, that would be a good rule to follow for all of us. Let's just exchange faults because everybody thinks he knows how to straighten the other fellow out. And then everything would be solved is the point. Thirdly, self-survival. We're talking about the first alternative to crucifixion of self is practicing self-survival. Self-survival is what causes church members to rationalize disobedience or sin in their lives. A lack of faith is sin, remember. So an example would be in financial matters, the fear of failure to survive financially will cause people to spend most of their time trying to get to a place of financial security rather than obeying Matthew 6.33 and seeking first the kingdom. Seeking first the kingdom will have to wait, most people think, until they've got the time for it. Well, I can't obey Matthew 6.33 literally, people think or say, what with all the financial problems I've got, I don't have time for it. You find people seeking shortcuts to financial security, especially in religious circles. It's like playing roulette. That's why you see them send in money for every scheme they hear over the radio or that comes through the mail or they see on TV. You know, send $20 for this paper prayer rug, kneel on it, and you'll prosper financially. Or send for this gold-painted not gold, gold-painted cross, and wear it, and you'll prosper. Or send in $10, and we will send you a piece of the evangelist shirt that he wore in a certain meeting where miracles took place. You know, I've always tried to figure out how in the world you can get 100,000 or more pieces out of the evangelist shirt to mail out to his mailing list. He must have worn the living room rug. <laughs> when he preached. I doubt if he'd get 100,000 pieces out of the rug. Or this little offer, send in for offer 495, and when you send in for that offer, coming back with what we'll mail you will be the angels of God who will be with you and stay with you and bless you from now on. Now that ought to really get a response from people who are seeking by every way they can, Christians, church members, to find financial security instead of using faith. We're saying self-survival is uppermost in their minds, and so they'll fall for schemes or try in every way possible except faith to find financial security or the matter of birth control. Now, the Bible doesn't teach birth control. It teaches that children are a blessing from the Lord. You're really blessed when you have your quiver full of arrows, according to the psalmist. But you see, birth control involves fear among young couples in the sense that they feel if they have children too soon that they will not be able to acquire the necessary possessions and money. I actually heard two preachers talking. They were talking about abortion, and they were anti-abortionists, of course, but they approved birth control. I don't know where you're at in your thinking, but you see, that's a total inconsistency. They say that it's wrong, it's a sin, and God disproves killing cells immediately, even after conception, because that's a personality already formed there. If you want to know when life begins, it's when the two cells unite. But there's already life in the two cells before they unite. It's sin, they said, in effect, to kill the personality an hour after conception, but there's nothing wrong with killing the cells before they ever unite. O oh, consistency, thou art a jewel. One of them went on to say that God calls some people to be childless. He calls some people to have a large family, or he calls some to have one or two children. We need chapter and verse on these things. So self-survival, we're saying, will cause people to disobey. Those are just examples. The same would be true of trusting the arm of the flesh for healing or whatever. Now another alternative to crucifixion besides self-survival is the practice of hiding from yourself. 
So of crucifying self, you hide from yourself. It takes the form of hiding from yourself. That's both outwardly and inwardly, as we'll show. Now, I've already pointed out in earlier studies how that so many people, especially in America, could be classified as plastic persons. Plastic persons, they pretend to be someone they're not. And outwardly, in order to be someone that they're not, they attempt to cover up who they really are with excessive cosmetics, hair pieces, face lifts, dyeing the hair, and whatever. Or they'll drive a Cadillac to give the impression, you know, they're affluent and they eat beans and potatoes at home to pay for it. Or they act like they're sophisticated and flunked out the first grade in school. Or they will dress flashy or hippie to try to impress the hippies that they're someone they're not. And half the hippies wouldn't claim most of the people who try to act like them today anyway, what with their expensive designer jeans and their $75 up to $150 athletic shoes and their clean t-shirt <laughs> with a logo on it. You see, no hippie would claim you if you have a clean t-shirt. It'd have to at least be all faded out under the arms. That's why they wear black, so the fade shows better <laughs> and smell like a hog pen. <laughs> or... They attempt to act the role of a Christian moving into the spiritual dimension by hiding under the religious cosmetics of hypocrisy. Most of them are running around, you know, saying they're trying to find themselves, find out who they really are, but they never will as long as they're hiding themselves from themselves, pretending they're someone else outwardly by the way they dress or the cosmetics or whatever. But if you want to imitate someone, I'd suggest you do what the Bible says and imitate Christ. You know, when you look in the mirror, the mirror will only tell you the truth if you present it with the truth. And I'm not trying to set rules or draw lines about what to wear or how you should look or whether or not you can wear some lipstick or not. That's for you to decide between you and the Lord. But we're talking about what we dealt with previously, the plastic person. And the mirror cannot give you back truth if you are hidden under, as I say, a face that the plastic surgeon gave you instead of God or cosmetics and that sort of thing. What would you think if the mirror, when you looked into it, presented you with another person? That's what you're presenting to the mirror. Now, what if the mirror turned it around? And another person appeared, you know, you're thin and suddenly you became fat. Or another face, another hairstyle or whatever. So this is why it pays us to look into a mirror that cannot lie, James 1, the Word of God. It'll tell you the truth. And then we've been talking about outwardly. Let's look a little at the inward situation because... Here's really what we're coming at. Are you hiding from your real emotions and feelings? Are you hiding from yourself concerning your real emotions and feelings? Some not only hide their true feelings from others, like a wife, a husband, and vice versa, and so on, but they'll hide their true feelings and emotions from themselves. And therefore, self never gets crucified, as I trust we'll show. You know what it is to hide your feelings from others? Like you have a friend that has missed God on something, and you would like to share with them and try to get them straightened out, but because of fear of hurting their feelings, you hide your feelings. But you can hide your feelings from yourself. For example, someone offends you and makes you angry but you deny you were offended or got angry to yourself. You deny it. You just say, oh, well, that didn't bother me. It maybe annoyed me a little for a minute, but it didn't bother me. But you actually got angry. And so this denial of the truth to yourself causes you to hide from yourself that you got angry, which is a sin, and therefore you don't repent of it. So you want to be on guard against hiding your feelings and emotions from yourself. 
See, it's one thing to confess, well, that didn't bother me, or I'm not going to let her bother me, or whatever, but it's another thing, if you were bothered, to deny it to yourself. Because, you see, you need to learn to repent. Self is not crucified in such cases. It's only denied, and the anger did not leave. It remains in your heart to surface later. And so, by an act of your will, you put it out of your mind, but what you have to do is repent so you can put it out of your heart. Now, we have this human tendency to want to pull the window shade on anything we don't want to face, that we are a person with a short temper, or I am a person that's impatient, or I talk too much, or I speak when I should listen, and so forth. Don't hide your true feelings and your true emotions. It's not confessing the negative, it's admitting that if you've missed it, that you did miss it, admitting it to yourself so you can repent. If it stays in your heart, it's going to surface later and it'll be worse. As someone said, hidden anger is just one letter away from danger, so you don't want to hide it. The psychos counsel you to vent your anger, to express your anger. Don't bottle it up. It's not good for you. Now, that's poor advice for a Christian. It's poor advice for anyone, because a Christian is not to vent his anger. That's a sin. He's to control it, repent of it, but it's bad advice. If you speak, and I think you'll admit this is true, when you're angry, you just made the best speech you'll ever regret. For every minute you're angry, you just wasted 60 seconds. And then thirdly, the alternative to crucifixion of self is the substitution of self-denial for the denial of self. Now, we've dealt with this before in other studies years ago. Somewhere along the line, I know I have. But an alternative for self being crucified is substituting self-denial for denial of self. If you deny self, self's being crucified at that point. But self-denial is not the same thing. The denial of self means that in any encounter with another person, that you sacrifice self, self-will, your wishes for the good and benefit of someone else. The denial of self with regard to God means the same thing. Anything involving yourself and God, you sacrifice self, self-will, your wishes, your desires for the good of the kingdom of God in order to do the will of God and not your own will. That's the denial of self. Jesus said, I came to deny self. I came not to do my will, but the will of the Father. He denied himself day after day. Now compare his words with the self-will expressed in the last few verses in Luke chapter 9, another passage we've taught on those would-be disciples who said to Jesus, I will follow you if you allow me first to do this or that. They kept saying, if you allow me first to do my will. Now that's an expression of self-will. But we said there is also the substitution of self-denial for the denial of self. You see, the denial of of potatoes and desserts or sweets because of a weight problem is what? That's self-denial. That isn't denial of self. Some people get very pious, you know, because they're on a diet. They have a weight problem and they piously complain, well, this is my cross that I have to bear. No, that isn't a cross. That's self-denial when you deny yourself food. That isn't the denial of self. Have you ever noticed that some people who have the willpower, in fact, I guess most, who have the willpower to diet lack the willpower to be quiet about it? They have the willpower to diet, they lack the willpower to be quiet. If there's anything worse than going on a diet is listening to someone that's on one <laughs> because they want to make up in sympathy what they're lacking or losing in food. 
All sorts of excuses why people do not want to be crucified with Christ. You can hear them if you just keep your ears open. You hear things like this. Well, if you just knew my husband, they're excusing why they're not being crucified with Christ. If you just knew my husband, he's so hard to live with and so hard to die to. Or, well, I know I should be in the Word more and pray more, but it seems like every time I try to get into a program of reading the Bible or reading it through, that something comes in and distracts me or I have to give it up for a while and then when I get back to it, I have to start over. I've forgotten what I've read and on and on. Excuses. There are a dime a dozen. You see, it doesn't matter if you run all the way around the bases and just end up at third base each time and never get through a task because of procrastination and whatever. I mean, if you're stopping at third base all the time, it doesn't get you any more than striking out because you're not, you know, making it home. You're not doing what you should. As someone said, if you ever put your hand to the plow and fail, next time, use your heart. Because you don't crucify your hand to the plow, you don't crucify your head, you crucify your heart. Failure in crucifixion, yes, we hear about it all the time. People fall down or come down from the cross, but the failure isn't falling occasionally from the cross. It's staying down after you fall. It's not having the persistence that you should. You see, failure is following the path of least persistence. And a lot of people do that. And most failures, as I said, are people who have excuses rather than reasons. A lot of people excuse their failures to be crucified with Christ. You may find them without money or without a job or without a positive confession, but you'll never find them without an excuse. Now, one of the best ways to cure yourself of making excuses about well, the things of the Lord, spiritual matters, is never give an excuse that you would not be willing to accept from someone else. That would eliminate about 99.5% of all excuses that you give. You wouldn't give one you wouldn't be willing to accept from your brother or sister because isn't it easy to point out that brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, they're just making an excuse. They could study the word or whatever if they really wanted to. And so never give an excuse that you wouldn't be willing to accept. Then we mentioned the hypocrites in religion who wear the religious cosmetics of hypocrisy, pretend they're being crucified with Christ when they're not. A definition of a hypocrite, a hypocrite never intends to do what he pretends to be. never intends to do what he pretends to be. And then fourthly, another alternative for the denial of self is the building of self-esteem. Everything you pick up, if you go in a bookstore or if you read the magazines, everything you hear is the popular idea of building a self-image, building your self-esteem, making a name for yourself. I mean, the ministers in the pulpit, the psychologists, the psychiatrists, people in religion are writing books and making fortunes on how to build your self-esteem. Man teaches self-esteem, but what does the Bible teach? Let each of us esteem the other person better than ourselves. Just the opposite. Philippians 2, 3, let each esteem the other better than himself. Self-esteem is diametrically opposed to the crucifixion of self, which is the message of the Bible. Man teaches that we ought to love ourselves. But dear friend, you don't have to be taught to do that. That's why Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. He already knows you love yourself. Paul said in Ephesians 5, no man hates himself. Of course not. You don't hate yourself. Even those who say they do don't really hate themselves. 
You ever heard anyone say, oh, I hate myself for having said that? No, you don't hate yourself. Old self is just embarrassed because self blew it. <laughs> Old self now has been exposed that it isn't perfect. You don't hate yourself. Do you ever hear a woman saying, oh, I hate the way I look? I hate myself because I don't look as attractive as sister so-and-so. No, you don't hate yourself. Because if you hated yourself, you'd be glad you didn't look so hot. <laughs> but because you love yourself, you want to look better to yourself and to others than you do. And so you hate yourself. No, you don't. You just hate the way you look. But the Bible, like in Galatians 5, teaches us to cultivate humility, not self-esteem. That's the message of man, not God. And no garment is more becoming a true Christian than the garment of humility. And when you purchase that by your faith, when you have the garment of humility, you'll never have to worry about it going out of style. It'll never go out of style. Like clothes do, you know, the wide lapels and the narrow lapels, and so I've saved a little of both. You just have to wait about five years and you're back in style. So I got a wide lapel on tonight, if you can see that for. But in Galatians 5, we're taught meekness. And in James chapter 4, we're taught that God resists the proud. Just the opposite to what self-esteem would cause to happen in your life. It would cause you to be proud. Now, while pride and self-esteem will keep a person off the cross, humility will put him there many times. You want to be crucified? Be a humble person. See, humility will never get you waited on first in a crowded shopping center or store. In fact, you'll probably, if you're humble, be the last to be waited on. Humility isn't noted for winning arguments. No, because a humble person will just concede the point, right or wrong, they don't care. Pride and self-esteem love flattery. You love to be flattered? Like actors, I read what one actor said, that actors live, thrive on flattery. Well, so do church members, but so does the whole world. But anyway, he said, if we don't get it from others, we flatter ourselves, and that's better because we're really sincere when we flatter ourselves. <laughs> You talk about pride and self-esteem. So unlike such people, flattery doesn't appear too well on a Christian. You see, flattery is like the seed in a peach. It isn't supposed to be swallowed. You're supposed to get rid of it. When people flatter you because you're humble, then you just lost your humility, if you believed it. So the point is, do like when you eat grapes or peach. Don't swallow it. And so the emptiest person you'll ever find in this world is a person who is full of self-esteem. That person is really empty. And if you are, as we're taught to be, in love with yourself, we're supposed to love ourselves, and you're going to have to get a divorce to be crucified with Christ. Because you can't be in love with self if it's going to die. You're going to have to hate old self and put it on the cross. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, help us to take seriously the admonition that if we're to be wedded to you through Christ, then it's going to be all Christ in us and none of us that will be crucified with him. And our lives will be his life lived through us. And we pray that you'll work in our spirits that which we need in this area. That we no longer substitute or have alternatives for the death of self. Whether they're excuses or placing the blame on others for our own weaknesses and failures. 
or the desire to survive, self to survive, to the extent that we would compromise or deny the Word of God, as so many have in these last days, but that we will take seriously the admonition we've heard and apply the Word where it's needed to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with us? Praise the Lord. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly. has shown a left ear. Uh, I get the impression it's infected, but that may not be the problem. A left ear. Praise the Lord. Well, a lot of people are receiving it, then receive your healing. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Would you put your hands down so that you can put them up and I can tell. Uh, how many of those were infections? Okay, that's what is impressed, and a number of them there, you see, are infections. But it wouldn't have to be that, necessarily. You exercise your faith. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Amen. I rebuke those infections in the name of Jesus. Be healed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Then it appears that it's a left hand again with emphasis is upon the first and the little finger, the index and the little finger. Now, it wouldn't have to be both for one person, but it could be both covering one, the little finger, index finger, all right, raise your hands in faith and be healed in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And then 
And what I see is an ankle. This is an ankle. I don't know whether it's the right or left. It seems to be the right ankle. Be the ankle area. I don't know what's wrong. I just see an ankle of clay. That means weakness. You receive that in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Look at all of those. The Lord knows the needs of His people. In the name of Jesus, be healed. Receive your healing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We command that ankle of clay to become an ankle of flesh. Whole, healthy, healed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for these revelations of the needs of your people and the meeting of them, the healings that so many times in the past that you've shown the needs and your people have been healed. And we believe it and receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise be to the Lord. Oh, shalom Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise be to the Lord. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Oh, shalom HaKashem. Blessed be the Lord. Oh, we thank you for your healing mercies. Hallelujah. Praise be to the Lord. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless and direct next week. Amen. What follows on this tape are some testimonies of healings from the previous Sunday night service you've just listened to. And we thought you would be blessed by hearing some of these testimonies, so we've included them on the end of this tape. Praise the Lord. We received the word of knowledge Sunday evening from Melissa for the ear, and uh, she's totally manifested that one. Praise the Lord for it. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, I want to praise the Lord that uh, Sunday night Dr. Freeman had a, a word of knowledge concerning the ankle, and I had a weak right ankle, and I praise God it was totally manifested. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord Jesus publicly praise the Lord for healing the infection in my left ear. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I want to thank Jesus for his faithfulness and the kindness that he gives to us each day. And I also want to thank him for the word of knowledge for the left ear and the strengthening of the ankle. Just so blessed, so blessed. And I thank him for those promises and he's faithful to them. And I could just go on and on, catching me in falls and protecting me. It's just such a blessing to know that he looks after us 24 hours a day, six days Amen. a week, 365 days a year. I'm Amen. blessed. Amen. So am I. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen.